So if your bees die, it's important to open the hive soon because if you don't do it on time, then other critters will get the remaining honey and the wax comb for you. And uh, you know, it's very sad to see colonies die, but unfortunately it's the reality for most beekeepers in this country that the bees are not doing as good anymore. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, sometimes bees will die in early winter because they run out of stores. But this is not the case here. We take out the frame and it's full of honey. So obviously this particular hive and we dug as a responsible beekeeper who left a lot of honey reserves for the winter didn't die because of starvation. What's the reason they died? Well, you see that bees are here, they're dead and there are two primary culprits that I see. First, unfortunately the model of the hive used in America today called the Langstroth hive is made out of very thin plank just three quarters of an inch thick. And uh, if there is a cold spell in the winter, this is certainly not adequate for insulating the colony properly so they can heat up the brood chamber and start rearing brood. Uh, bees like us or like chickens, they need to incubate their own larva and brood at a certain temperature around 95 degrees. So if you use hives that have very thin walls like here, the conventional American hive, and the weather is very cold. They just have trouble raising the temperature enough. So unfortunately, just the hive model itself can contribute to hive mortality like this. Another reason is the bees themselves. The commercial stock that you buy as packages or even nooks are, has very little disease resistance. Uh, the wild bees living in the woods, they were honed by uh, nature to be resistant to varomites and other pests and parasites and disease. And today, the commercial stock has very little resistance. Therefore, the viruses that varomites and other pests carry with them can kill a colony like what we see here. So what's the solution? Well, of course, if you use a hive that's well insulated, it would be one line of defense. But most importantly, it's not the box that beekeeping starts with. Beekeeping starts with the bees. So if you want to keep bees sustainably without them dying on you every spring or winter, we need to get resilient bees. And fortunately, you don't even have to buy them because they live someplace here in the woods in bee trees. We just need to catch a swarm with the genetics of these local bees. Not only they are more disease resistant, resistant, but they are also winter hardy, something that's extremely important for beekeeping in the north. Well, that's good. At least it wasn't my fault that they died. It was not. <laughs> and as a bonus, you have quite a bit of honey to extract. Yeah, so we can still just uh, cap, cap those and then... Yeah, you know, even if the colony died from viruses transmitted by the varomite, the good news is that these viruses are harmful to humans. Right. So uh, y there is no infectious disease or virus in the beehive that could be bad for you. Right. So it's co completely safe to take these frames and uh, use this honey. Right, so like a lot of you guys uh, um, often ask about honey during the winter and stuff, so you can perfectly see we'll be able to harvest this and it's sat here during the winter time, not knowing when they actually died, but it's still usable honey. And this this box is pretty good weight to it. Uh, I bet the next one has even more. Yeah, and it's a very good policy to leave more honey in the winter than you think the bees will need. Yeah, that's what I did. Because there, if there is a surplus, you can always pull it in the spring. Right. But leaving a good reserve, you are not risking. that and you wanted to harvest it in the spring do you just come out when they start getting active and take it off and exactly harvest it and then put because, it back on yeah the bees don't really care for honey as food it's their strategic survival reserve right to get in the winter in the spring when there are there is nectar in flowers they would rather get fresh stuff and from the flowers than the stored honey right so it's useless for them and basically if you ever use sugar water is that going to keep them kind of lazy instead of going out and doing their thing. It could because it spoils them like sugar spoils children. Yeah. It gives them a sweet tooth. They know they can get all this sweetness for nothing without flying. So they do tend to Fat be... Fat and lazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what we are doing here, we're taking it apart. And yes, this box is also <laughs> very heavy. So we probably have still... Uh, oh, 
50 pounds of uh, honey for duck. Yeah, uh, I tried to leave it all there right. for him. Yeah, Missouri from Russia. We wanted to start an apiary and we went from zero beehives to 40 beehives without ever buying any bees. The thing is that there are swarms flying around, no matter where you live, in the country, in the city, the bees swarm in the spring and the swarms are looking for a new home. So if you take a box about the size of this one and hang it in the tree in the spring, then the same way as birds move into bird houses, the bees will move into the house you prepared for them. The swarms need a cavity to uh, found a new colony and because there are fewer cavities around in big oak trees mm, left, then if you give them an artificial box, a small hive this size, and then they're very likely to move inside. So what we will do here with the boxes from this colony, we'll prepare what's called a bait hive or swamp trap. Swamp trap is nothing dangerous, you are not hurting the bees, you are giving a swarm a good home to move into and found a colony. Not only these bees will be coming to you for free, but they will be coming from a local colony and has much greater chance of being disease resistant and uh, well adapted to your local climate. So I'm kind of wondering, because we saw all the bees at the top and he thinks it maybe might be the Varoma, why were they at the top if they have plenty of honey to eat? You know, normally they migrate up as they eat. Uh, yes, but in the spring it has to do with the uh, warmth. In a vertical stack hive like this one, the warm air rises to the top, so they follow their instinct of wanting to be not just where the food is but where the warm air is. Uh, so they go up there and then it creates a problem because the walls of the Langstroth hive are so thin mm. and the thermal mass of honey is very large. They have trouble heating all of this with their small bodies and it may contribute to the die off like you see. Right. But the primary culprit is probably the varomites and viruses they carry. Now is there a way to see those in here or is it microscopic? No, you can see them and they're very small but certainly you can see them and if I find one I will show you. So now that we're preparing this box to be used as a bait hive to attract a swarm, we're making sure that there are no frames of honey left in there. Because the swarms are not attracted to honey, uh, you can take and use all the honey yourself. The swarms are attracted to a cavity. Right. They are looking for a place to move into. So uh, whichever frames of honey we find will remove because we don't want to live there. It would be robbed by robber bees anyway. By the way, in uh, this frame, you see this paste at the bottom of the cells. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And this is called bee bread. Uh, fermented pollen, it's very good food for humans too, it's a natural probiotic. So even just taking a spoon and taking this is, is great stuff. Good. Um, there is a little bit of risk of leaving it in there uh, because there, the pollen in the cells is protein and protein can uh, attract wax moths. Yeah, that's what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And there are already some wax moths here. This is this. This is called the great wax moth. They serve butterfly. They feed on uh, the calm and the special bee bread left by the dead colonies. So if you were to, if you have a choice of giving these different frames in the box that we will use as a bait hive, preferably use an empty cell calm like this without a lot of bee bread there. So, because this can attract wax moth. So, I'm putting this aside. If we have enough frames, 10 frames without bee bread, this is what you will use. If you don't have bees yet and you're starting with an empty box, just by all means give them empty frames. Right. Because again, they don't need a comb. This they can build themselves. They just need a place to live. So, here is one good frame. Yeah, they just want to go to work. Mm hmm. Find a new house and start setting it up the way they like it. And we call them honeybees, but they don't no, no. care for honey. Honey is for them just a way of surviving the winter. Right. In the spring they need uh, a new place to live more than they need honey reserves. They store bee bread in their brood chamber, the lower box where they uh, raise a new generation of bees because this is their source of protein. Right. And most of the frames here we see uh, full of bee bread. So we'll take 
okay what frames we have without it but sir, if we have no choice we will leave the frames with vibrant too except you have to monitor it more often so here's another frame with no vibrant which is very good and there the bees don't need frames in this box to move in there but you do if you were to give them an empty box they would move in and they would start building wild calm in all directions yeah then you won't be able to pull out the frame and harvest honey easily. Yeah, so these frames are basically for us. <laughs> yes, for, for the convenience of the beekeeper. Right. But it also is good for the bees because instead of opening the box and with a knife, just cutting out pieces of comb and they're destroying their nest, you're able to take out the frame, spin out honey and returning to them with much less disturbance. Right. So in this box we have three frames uh, with no bee bread and we'll use our, these three or four frames. I'll go through another box. So this is what's called the deep Langstroth body. And if you are getting into beekeeping, this is probably the equipment that their, your local bee club will recommend. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I use our, a different setup called the Lanes Hives. You can get free plans on my website, horizontalhive.com. But uh, I'll explain uh, later why it makes a difference in terms of the shape and the thickness of the walls. But uh, this is the most common equipment and uh, it is the right size of attracting the swarm. One of the most important things in attracting a swarm to a box is the right volume of the box. Right. If the box is too small, the swarm doesn't move in because they have no room to expand and store reserves. Right. If the box is too big, they don't want to move in too either. to protect. To protect, to heat in yeah. the winter. So they need to have the right size. And it's not my opinion on somebody else's. Researchers gave bees different boxes of different sizes and looked which ones attracted the most swarms. And the size of about this box, which is 10 gallons, turned out to be what bees prefer. So if you have this kind of equipment lying around or buy it, and this is what you will want to use as your swamp catcher. So just, uh, uh, you will take a bottom board or a piece of plywood, put a box on it, fill it with frames, and there, then you'll be ready to put it up. Or, uh, Another thing that you will want to put it in here when all the frames are in place is a, a lemongrass swarm lure. The reason it works is that when a skull bee from a swarm discovers a cavity that she likes, she marks it with a smell right. that is very similar to lemongrass oil. So if you put some lemongrass oil smell into the box to attract the swarm, even the first cow that comes there gets a smell as if a hundred other scouts already were there right. and marked it as a good home for the bees. So all it takes is taking a small plastic vial. It's important to put the lemongrass oil in special slow release tubes because the bees sense of smell is 100 times stronger than ours. So you cannot just put straight yeah. essential oil there, it would be too strong. So scientists develop a special kind of slow release tubes. That's the plastic that will be releasing the oil through the walls. So the smell is not overwhelmingly strong for the bees. So you have filled this, we'll actually do it now, with lemongrass oil. And if you already have the lemongrass oil, uh, you just can get the tubes. They're very inexpensive. I have them on horizontalhive.com. But uh, you fill it with the oil two tubes, half filled per hive, and you just place it into this uh, bait hive to attract the swarm. Again, the reason it works is because it happens to have the chemical composition similar to the bees' own attractant pheromone. Makes perfect sense. And we do close the lid. There are no pin holes in here, but this is the special plastic that will be releasing the smell of the oil through the walls. So it will stay there the whole summer. Uh, the swarming season here in Missouri starts say, in the last week of April, and the smell will stay there until October when the, uh, you, you get the very last swarms of the season. You know, with honeybees, it, no, nothing is wasted. Um, if I have a colony that dies and you have this sad picture of bees are lying on the bottom board with no movement, you can actually save this. And you think, why would I want to save the dead bees? 
Well, the dead bees have been used as a folk medicine remedies for all kinds of conditions uh, since the times of ancient Iraq, 4,000 years ago. One recipe that I want to try is they would take dead bees, fry them in olive oil, and make this black paste that they were rubbing into the skull of balding males to provide uh, for more hair growth. Uh, I will soon need that, so I will probably fry these in olive oil and give it a try, and I will report uh, whether it still works. But the recipe is 4,000 years old, and it was so valuable they carved it on clay tablets that were discovered during excavations in ancient Iraq. Yeah, and you know, you'll have actually yourself a chance to see whether this uh, ancient recipe works uh, if you come to the uh, Homestead Life Conference in Hannibal in August 2019. I'll be there and uh, we'll discuss the results. Uh, this resin that you see here is uh, called propolis. This is what bees collect from uh, uh, poplars or willows, anything that has sticky resin on it, and conifer trees too. This is extremely valuable. If uh, uh, I chewed myself for, for healthy teeth, people were using it for thousands of years to sanitize your mouth and uh, for wound care because it kills germs. And if you were to sell it uh, from a chemical tree hive, it fetches a price of $10 an ounce on eBay. So a wonderful product to get from the bees. So uh, all around the hive, you have these deposits of propolis mixed with wax. It's very good for you. It's the ancient form of uh, chewing gum. So if you have a piece like that, just put it in your mouth as you work the hive and you just feel this wonderful aroma penetrating into sinuses, just very good thing. So to put these vials in, they need to be by the open entrance somewhere where the scouts can detect the smell easily. You can even just press them into existing comb if that's what you start out with. Like you have this at the top of it, does it need to be facing downward? Yeah, it has to be facing downward like that and then you place it there so that this side, where this uh, small bottle of vial by the entrance where the scouts will be in. Right. But these do, they will keep the smell at the right concentration the entire swarming season, maximizing your chances of catching a swarm. This is bee bread. The pollen that bees collect from flowers, they bring it into the hive, mix it with nectar, and then add enzymes and ferment it using the same lactobacteria that we use for fermenting sauerkraut or yogurt. So this is, in the very direct sense, a natural probiotic. When I was growing up in Russia, my mom would give me a teaspoon of this material, of this bee bread, every day as a probiotic. You don't have to buy it in store. It's packed with nutrients and their beneficial lactobacteria. Uh, you need to eat it in moderation because one teaspoon of this bee bread uh, may have uh, pollen from 20,000 flowers. So, but it's very good food for you. It's also very good food for wax moths. These butterflies that would come in, deposit larva there, eggs there, and the larva would be crawling around, spinning cocoons and webs and destroying and eating the stuff. So if you, you use this frame in your bait hive to attract a new swarm, we want to remove this uh, pollen. Uh, we'll use it ourselves and this way you won't have any infestation with wax moths. If you were to store a frame like that, you would want to put it in a freezer for 24 or 48 hours. This would kill any eggs of wax moth that could be present there. And if you use plastic foundation like in this frame, you don't have to be afraid of damaging the comb. You just remove the cells that contain this orange paste and the bees will rebuild them. The one thing you have to be careful of if you're out here tasting on your honey and your propolis and all that is, you know, if you get going too much on this stuff, you could get a little, little shaky. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you eat too much. You got to be everything in moderation. So, what are these like little balls? Is that just part of the? No, these are the, the cocoons, or that the bees spin are, when they are transforming themselves from a larva into an adult bee. Uh -huh. Like butterflies, right. they do make a cocoon inside the cell. This is why it acquires this very dark brown color eventually. 
but cocoons uh, are made out of protein too so you can eat them wow if you guys could taste this it tastes i never really had this before because i always leave everything alone in the lower bottom so i've never actually pulled this out and tasted it mm -hmm. wow and you know most beekeepers in america never tasted this bee bread because yeah. if they treat their bees with chemicals oh you can't yeah. you, you you don't want to eat that right, right. but if it's coming from a chemical free hive then uh, it's very good food unfortunately it will still if a dog was to take this and send it off to the lab for analysis it would show that there are some residues of pesticide because of the fl flowers that bees yeah. visited and there is just another message of how polluted our environment has become bees are really showing us that uh, mm, even the food you get from your own bees and your treatment free chemical free hives will have some pesticide renew yeah. because of what your neighbors are doing yeah that's another reason why we never have done that uh, why we've been raising our bees is using any kind of chemicals or anything we've always tried to go the natural way because just like everything we talk about around here these animals all lived well before we started meddling with them so it's best that we do the least we can and then we can all work copacetically together and you know today uh, people are buying a, a local honey because they want to have local pollen in it right. so this is what you are after right and if you get it in this form just a very small quantity at the tip of a knife will give you more pollen uh, than probably half a jar of honey. Wow. If you use conventional equipment, a box like that with all the frames are, is what makes a great bait hive or swamp catching hive. Uh, there is some uh, uh, honey still here. You don't have to clean it up because it will attract robbers, but it's good because robbers will uh, find the box and will learn the location and when they're calling you swarms they will remember that there was this cavity and actually i'm more likely to discover the box so just put this on the bottom board use a solid bottom board like this with no screen this would provide too much ventilation better to use a solid bottom board like that so you put it there you put what's called the inner cover all this propolis is perfect there because the smell of propolis is another attractant together with oil and slow release tubes you cover it and then uh, put a strap to hold it together and this small one box five is all you need to finish your own thing. as a beekeeper you have a um, choice of two basic hive models the vertical hive most people in this country are, are familiar with but also horizontal hives that have been in use since ancient egypt 4000 years ago I only keep my bees in horizontal hives. I grew up in Russia where half people have horizontal hives, so they are very common and half use verticals. And my uncle who taught me beekeeping, I could tell the older he was getting, the more horizontal hives were left. <laughs> now he's 80 yeah. and he still keeps bees, but only horizontal hives. Right, right. Because the first obvious advantage is that the horizontal boxer requires no heavy lifting. I have people in their 90s who buy hives like that from me, With veterans in the wheelchair. You can keep bees as long as you can lift one frame at a time. There are no 70 pound supers of boxes to lift. So we it's actually one had a, We actually had a comment on the video yesterday when I told you guys that he was coming and she already had used the horizontal hives and she's in a wheelchair and it enables her to still keep bees. So I love to hear that story. You know, another great benefit is that you can make this box because it's stationary box. You are not lifting the box. You can make it out of, out of, out of thicker lumber. Right. So this box is made out of two by lumber, which is one and a half inch thick this is just three quarters of an inch thick so right. this one already has a hundred percent more insulation compared to this one just like that boom the third big benefit is that in the horizontal box when you open it you have access to all frames all at the same time we better flip this one around yeah <laughs> sure you ready <laughs> the reveal <laughs> all right great benefit of horizontal hives too is that you have access to any frame in the hive without moving or shuffling boxes around. In this one, in a vertical hive, honey would be in the upper box and the brood chamber where the bees raise their young bees would be in the lower two boxes. Now, the brood is something that can be attacked by parasites and viruses and infectious disease, 
So if you wanted to check the quality of your brood for the presence of disease in the lowest box, you would need to remove all the stack together. If I need to do the same thing here, I just pull one frame from the brood chamber, check it and pull it back. So compare the amount of effort required for you and the amount of disturbance for the bees of dismantling a full stack, doing it and stacking it back, or just taking one frame, checking it and putting it back. Finally, in a horizontal hive, the bees segregate honey from brood horizontally. One end where the open entrance is would be their brood chamber. Uh, they do it by the open entrance to ventilate the brood and this is easier because this is where all the food is coming in. And away from the open entrance is where honey will be. So I can put additional frames in the honey section of the hive on this end and I can eventually pull them when the time comes to harvest it without touching the brood chamber. So for a beekeeper who just has a few hives in their backyard, if you don't move thousands of hives to California to pollinate almonds, there is no reason why you need to go with a model that requires heavy lifting and that's very hard on the beekeeper and on the bees alike. Uh, this is my recommendation, I'm very happy with it and they will probably produce the same amount of honey as the vertical stacks, but with much less effort. Horizontal hives are really easy to manage. If you catch a swarm, you put it in one end of the box, or if you buy a small hive or a package of bees, you just install them in one end on five, six frames, and then you keep adding more frames going horizontally in the box. So when you decide how to put your hive, uh, make sure that the opening is away from the prevailing winds. So we turn it around so you can see what we are doing here, but uh, this is facing north. So you won't want this to be facing north when the bees are in. This would be too much wind, especially in the winter time. So we'll turn it around for this to face south. And it's really beneficial to have a windbreak on the north side or whichever your prevailing winds are, uh, either stock, uh, stack some, some um, straw bales there with a piece of plywood, but anything you can do, put it against the wall to protect it from the wind in the winter would be very beneficial for bees to help conserve the heat at the coldest time of the year. When you actually set this box up for the first time, you'll, you won't have all these frames in here. No, You're just going to start Correct. at one end. And actually it's beneficial to take a piece of plywood and limit the volume first because when you install a small colony, they would have trouble ventilating and protecting and heating the whole volume. So limit it to maybe 10 frames first. When you see that they're already active on all 10 frames and it's packed with bees, it's time to add more space. Mm -hmm. So what, I would just take that out put four or five more frames in and then close it off and again? Exactly, so and these slabs allow you to not disturb the whole hive in the process, but only work with the section you require. So if you already have bees established here and you're just wanting to add more frames, you open these two slats, put three more frames and cover them back. And three weeks later you open two more slats and keep going like that. Alright, we gotta take a rain break. according to gravity, so if the box is skewed, there may be some wild but irregular font construction and we want to avoid that. It looks much better now. And the paintings of your boxes are not just beautiful, they are also functional. It helps the bee find her own home. If the hives are all identical like this and another and another, there is a lot of drift. Bees leaving from one box and then returning to the other box by mistake which spreads disease. If one hive is diseased, all the rest get the infection. With boxes that have unique designs painted on them, it's easier for bees to find their own home and it keeps them healthier for that. Uh, you know, for me, ultimately, uh, working with the bees using natural beekeeping, it's not just about honey or even livelihood, it's about uh, protecting the landscape, keeping it uh, uh, ecologically sound. I know that from one acre of my land in the Ozarks I can do more in terms of even income and economic value by having bees on the wild plants 
than any farm around me could by turning it into a pasture. So by working with local bees and doing treatment-free beekeeping, you are also helping to conserve the blossoming landscapes around you. In nature, the distance between bee trees in the woods may be half a mile. So there is a colony living in this tree and then there is a vast uh, distance to the next colony, which minimizes the drift and the transfer of disease. So if you have multiple colonies, the more you can spread them, the better. Certainly don't put them a few feet away. Uh, it was recommended at least 100 feet. I know it may not be practical for you, but A, spread them as much as you can, position them so that they are not in the straight line, but are randomly uh, scattered across the landscape. etc. to help the bees find their home and they're not go to the wrong time. We talked how the volume of the box for attracting honeybee swarms is important. They do not like something small because there is not enough room for expansion. They don't like huge boxes because it's too difficult to heat in the winter and protect and clean. So it was established that 10 gallons is the right size and this is the box we have. Now, another important part is to have the scent of lemongrass oil in there, we added this. And the third most important ingredient in success is to have the box elevated at least 10 feet up in the tree. Because the scouts for the swarm are looking for protection from predators if there is a, a box sir, at the ground level, the bees know they will be harassed by raccoons and opossums and bears, etc. So they are really preferring um, boxes set up or anywhere. It could be on a tree, on a utility pole, on the roof of your RV or on a deer stand. You want to make sure that this whole assembly is very solid, especially when you get the bees in there and you start taking it down. Uh, you don't want, if it falls, for the uh, lid to come off and all the bees get out. Uh, I, I had been hanging maybe hundreds of swamp traps and I only dropped it once, but I was very uh, glad I had the top very well attached to the body uh, because this is one instant when you can really aggravate the bees. So use a ratchet strap or even just uh, screws to screw through the top, but it needs to be solidly attached to the uh, body of the box. And on my website, horizontalhive.com, I have uh, free plans for building swamp traps like that at the cost of materials. At the very, It's a very simple project that anyone with a table saw and some simple tools can muster but okay so now it's good to be put up wherever your elevated position is uh, on this deer stand safety first so make sure that if you use an extension ladder that it is really solid if you're going up on it for a deer stand make sure it's well attached now before leaving it here you want to make sure that it's all aligned well so the water doesn't go inside the box and this box is all set up to attract the swarm now when the weather warms up and you see bees on the flowers uh, you come and check it there every week every two weeks so what you may see first is a lot of bees that check out the box these are the scouts they come and they fly around the box as if they're uh, knocking their heads against the wall so these are the scouts. If you come and you see that the bees are flying in circles, come in and out, and there is this regular traffic of bees coming in and out, then the swarm is inside. So when you see that the swarm is in the box, you come in the evening after all the foragers return from the flowers, you climb up, you cover the entrance with something to contain the bees, uh, but let air through. For example, staple number eight hardware cloth, the wire mesh, uh, to cover the entrance. It can also be a piece of duct tape with small pinholes made with a, a pocket knife or with a small nail. But you need to provide air but contain the bees during the transfer from the tree to where the permanent hive will be. Now, 
if the hive is going to be under the same tree you can just take the box and put it under the tree if you want the hive to be a few hundred yards away you cannot just move the box from there to the new side because the foragers remember this spot and will be returning here in which case you need to take it out five miles leave it there for a week with the entrance open so they forget this location and after a week five miles away bring him to where the permanent location will be again you don't have to do it if the hive is going to be straight under the tree where the swamp trap caught you this uh, uh, the column the species of the tree doesn't matter it can be an oak black walnut whatever what matters though is that you need to pick a tree where the box will be highly visible like what we have here do not put it in the middle of a cedar tree or anything where it will be covered with branches because it will make it difficult for scouts to locate Another thing is that the tree close to the edge of vegetation, like what we have here, barely into the woods, are, uh, works much better than in the middle of a big forest. Again, because the uh, edge of the forest is some place where foragers will be able and scouts will be able to locate it more easily. Finally, it's great if there is a source of water nearby. Bees need that. And if there are flowers, wildflowers that bees visit for nectar in this vicinity, uh, it's uh, very beneficial for attracting the swarm. Uh, one more thing, with the beauty of this method is that you do not need to know where the bees are actually coming from. The scouts will find the box and the swarm will move in. But if you know where the swarm is coming from, for example from your own hive or from an unknown bee tree, don't put it too close. In nature they like to spread so as not to compete with the mother colony for the same flowers. So if you put a box 300 yards away from an existing colony that you know might be swarming, then it will increase your chances of catching a swarm from them. If you want to increase your chances of catching a swarm, and you should be putting out multiple swarm traps. Uh, I have a 50% success rate. For every two boxes I set out, I catch one swarm. Uh, your success rate may be higher or lower it really depends on your area how many bees there are and how many options they have so if you want to maximize your chances by setting out multiple swamp traps make sure you spread them at least one mile apart this way you have very good coverage of the area and may attract many swarms and when you do after transferring them to the permanent hive put an empty swarm catching box back on where this box was because you can catch more than one swarm on the same tree the same year nugget overload Big time. <laughs> hopefully you guys enjoyed dr leo visiting the property we were able to break open the hives um we're pretty sure that i did a pretty good job i did make a mistake on having the hives too close together and you guys are hopefully you're learning from this right this is why we post these videos for you guys to glean from he has tons of experience in raising bees we have some experience but it's always good to get your continuing education all the time there's new stuff people are learning and trying to share all the time knowledge is power yeah and there is more information on my website horizontalhive.com there is a free swarm catching guide. So things we discussed yep. about how the box should be set up to be attractive to swarms. It's all there on horizontalhive.com at no charge. I also have free plans for you to build your own swarm catching box and any horizontal hive equipment so you can get it uh, for the cost of materials. I also sell the swarm catchers if you don't uh, do woodworking and would rather get one. Now is the time to get it because right. the swarms start flying any moment. There's also uh, a few books. I'll show you these guys real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, I also can highly recommend two books. This is the best introduction to natural beekeeping, keeping bees with no chemicals, with no sugar feeding, and keeping them alive. Uh, working with local swarms, it's all in the book, Keeping Bees with a Smile. It was first written in the Russian language and became a bestseller there. And I read it in the original and translated it for you. Uh, available at horizontalhive.com and elsewhere on the internet. And the second book, one of the classics of natural beekeeping, was written by the French author a hundred years ago called Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives and it covers all the information you need to keep bees uh, naturally in uh, horizontal hives that don't break your back. 
And then this is a beautifully illustrated book. What's it about? Uh, it shows how bees are kept all over the world in 23 different countries and expands your understanding of what's possible in beekeeping, wow. showing you the whole range of options from keeping bees in the box like we do to even climbing into cliffs like they do in Asia or even digging up uh, honey ants are in uh, the wilderness in Australia. So it's called Honey from the Earth. It took 15 years to produce and traveled to 40 different countries. I work with the French photographer who did all the travels. And in addition to stunning photography, uh, you uh, have text written by some of the leading people uh, uh, around the world on the topic of honey bees and honey. It's a stunning example of uh, the richness of our culture that right. surrounds the beekeeping because wow. for me bees are not just about honey or even livelihood uh it's, it's about survival yeah. <laughs> for us <laughs> but it's also about uh, just this very vibrant experience right. of doing it and they're feeling more alive we really enjoy keeping bees i've enjoyed it ever since we started doing it it's been several years now so i've had a good time doing it we like the benefits of it and we always try to leave honey on uh for them to get through winter so hopefully you guys got some good information in this video I don't forget <laughs> if you have any questions you got to come to the hannibal conference the homesteading life conference and you can talk to Dr. yeah Leo. he's gonna have a little workshop and all of his stuff there and q a and all that stuff so if you want to get some tickets for that it is limited seating also all of his information will be down in the first comment under this video um no matter where you're watching it and that way you'll be able to connect with him if you want to get some of this information one of the things i don't know if you guys are picking up on this about stacy and myself is we really gravitate towards open sourcing, okay? What we wanna find is people um, like Dr. Leo and, and like us, providing free information to help educate people so we can move the whole needle on sustainability. So hopefully, again, you guys liked the video and say goodbye to Dr. Leo. But we're not ready to go yet. We're not, what are we doing now? Oh, that's right, what is it? We, are we have a giveaway. That's right, it's a giveaway. Which book would you like to do? These two. These two. So. Okay, so we're gonna give away two books. One, Keeping Bees with a Smile and Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives. And all you have to do is leave a comment down below. Say, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. And then we'll randomly select two people out of there and then we'll send off one copy to each one of you guys. So we appreciate you guys watching and we hope you have a good weekend. See you guys. Bye!